Hey guys, this is K2's Retro Workshop. Today we're going to work on these PowerBook 100 series AC adapters. These adapters are typically so bad off they have no output anymore and a lot of people think they're dead, but a recap and a cleanup usually gets them working again. I decided to do this because my 386SX40 to 486SLC33 upgrade is not going to plan and I, I need a win right now. So... I'm going to show you how to crack these guys apart, how to service them, recap them, and get them all back together. And uh, yeah, here we go. All right, it's going to seem brutal, but this screwdriver is the best way to get into one of these bricks. The trick is right here, you'll see there's a rubber grommet here where the line to the laptop comes out, and there's a plastic ledge here. What you want to do is you want to force the screwdriver in there and try to pry up and back on it. And you hear that? That's the glue popping in the seam there. So it'll allow you to get your screwdriver in there a little bit more and continue to pry at it until the glue breaks. We'll be able to glue this back together later, so it's not a big deal having it break right now. If I can get this other side to break, we'll be doing pretty good. Alright, so that's the glue. Pop this guy off. And it doesn't smell bad or anything. That's pretty good. Now the circuit board's not just going to pop out of this. What we need to do is right back here where this basically between these two pots and this capacitor right here there's a screw way down at the bottom there so we take a small Phillips uh, number one screwdriver put it down there give it a few turns screw comes right out and board pops right out so at this point you want to take your soldering iron to these two points here, get this cord off, and soldering iron here, get these two points off. Everything should be labeled. Um, there's a little W where the white goes here, a B where the black goes, and the same over here. There's a white, oh, and the same over here. There's a white and a brown. So everything's labeled. All you got to do is desolder it and then resolder it when you're done. All right, so we've got to get these off. Uh, there's pretty big blobs of solder here. If you have a set of safety glasses that you like to use, I highly recommend using them. Uh, you never know where this solder is going to go. I haven't had any fly off on me yet taking these apart, but as you can see, like this one's stuck a little bit, so you're going to have to tug on it a little bit, and it's it can be dangerous to your vision. Oh, come on. Get out of there. What is going on with you? There we go. Okay. Love old electronics, don't you? And here's the same story. You've got large globs of solder there you can see here and here. And you're going to potentially um, blind yourself if something decides to you know pop loose or something during this you really should wear glasses all the time I've got a set of clear safety glasses I always wear but to each their own I've splattered solder enough to not to know better than that okay so now we have our three boards ready for decap and I'm just going to do the same thing I always do. Um, my old solder sucker and get them out of there. There's a couple of caps in here that are kind of funny. So I'll zoom in on those and uh, show you how to get those out. So if you look right in here, you will see that the there's a little tiny cap right there. It's kind of hard to see right there. This cap can be difficult and there's a cap right here that can also be difficult. They're kind of perpendicular to one another. So when you're ordering caps, you got to make sure you get them about the same size. 
Um, there's a standard size, it's a five millimeter by, I wanna say eight millimeters tall, something like that. And they will work here. Um, but especially this one right here under this heat sink, you can't go too tall. Cause it's, as you can see from the factory, it barely clears. So we, you, you gotta be mindful of that when you're ordering. Something else you might notice here is all the goop that's right here. This is all electrolyte that's come out. These three capacitors right here are usually the ones that leak in these and they can get so bad that the copper on the underside, you can even see it here how the solder mask came off a bit uh, where I took this capacitor out. It gets in there and it just wreaks havoc and uh, that's part of why this unit stops working in the first place. So uh, after I decap this, I like to give them a clean and uh, that's just my standard soap, water bath, uh, blow it off with some compressed air, and then put it in the um, oven for a bit. And that's it. So when it comes to this capacitor right here, one final note, you've got this goop right here they use to keep the PCBs all in, um, you know, from vibrating around and breaking their connections and such. The, what I like to do here is I'll take a razor blade and I will cut the goop back. You can leave it on there. I find it doesn't really smoke or anything when it's been left on there. And it's not too difficult to cut and uh, remove this way. But I find that um, if it gets hot with the soldering iron, it really acts like just candle wax almost and you wind up with a, um, you know, a goop that's, it doesn't smoke or anything, but it does kind of gunk stuff up. So if you just cut this back a little bit like this, you can desolder this bottom connection without having to deal with regooping these or anything. Um, none of this really has to come apart for what we're doing. So this works perfectly here. All right, we've got these guys washed, bathed, and uh, dried out. I blew them out. Typically I will bake them if I'm working on them really fast for a good um, half hour at say 80 C or so in the oven. But um, it's so dry here that just blowing them out, kind of letting them sit out overnight does the job. There's not a whole lot uh, that's tricky about putting it all back together. The glue and stuff's all out of the way now. The uh, trickiest part is probably these two caps right here. They're perpendicular to one another, and the one on the board here is um, blocked if you put the bottom one in first. So I would populate the two on this sideboard first, and then go in and do the bottom board. But like I said, that's, that's really all there is to it as far as that goes. So I'm gonna go ahead and switch to my overhead view and solder all these caps in, and then we will proceed to test and make sure they work again. And just a quick note here, when you order these parts, what I like to do is there's a customer part number field in the uh, shopping cart of like DigiKey and Mauser and such. Go ahead and put the uh, part number for where it goes on the board on there. And man, it makes this so much easier. You don't have to keep track of where all these caps went when you've got your part number right there, ready to go. A note or two about the capacitor types that I'm using here. Uh, I like the Worth Electronics ATLL series. That series is a long life, like 7,000 hour capacitor rated at 105 C. The problem that you end up with with that is that some of the capacitors like C252 is a tiny cap on this board. And therefore the cap that I ordered to replace it is actually a lot bigger than the one that originally went in there. So double check your measurements and such. The bulk electrolytic that I got for this was also one size too fat. I made it work, but it was too big. These power bricks are a lot less forgiving on capacitor size than something like an analog board or something like that. So that's something to keep in mind when you're ordering capacitors to replace the ones that come in this power brick.
All right, so we've got our DC supply all put back together. Um, we got the caps in here. Uh, earlier I had said it's easier to put the caps on this board here. That's actually only true for this side. Uh, this little cap right down in there, that one's easier to do first and it's still a pain in the butt. Over here, this cap right here that's coming out under the pots, I recommend doing that one after doing the one that's below it because I did them the other way around and it took me way longer than I really liked to on that bottom piece there. So um, side cap here first, bottom cap here first, and it shouldn't be that hard. Um, one thing I see a lot online is people asking about these pots. Do I adjust them? Do I mess with them? Well, in general, the answer is gonna be no. Um, this power supply, as you can see here, only has two wires going out to the uh, barrel connector. So what happens is when you get a two amp load on this guy, you're dropping about 0.4 volts across this. So you test it unloaded and you're gonna see close to eight volts. The laptop says two and a half, seven and a half input, but it runs a linear supply. You're not gonna break anything on that. Um, the laptop itself may get a little warmer if it's got a high voltage in it, but if you're switching to the SCSI to SD modules in any of your power books, it doesn't matter. So what I like to do for testing is to use this little uh, kind of cheap DC load here. It's rated for 150 watts. It's got USB plugs in the bottom and a nice convenient barrel connector on the side here. Um, it's easy enough to test these power supplies. You just plug it right in there and you've got your DC load hooked up. Now for this guy, when you're gonna plug it in and make it live, this heat sink right here is line potential. You will get shocked if you touch that while it's plugged in. So what I do is I take a extension cable, plug the power supply in with to that, and then I plug that into the wall. So if we do that, power supply comes up and you see 7.9, 4.93 volts. That's about what you should see fully uh, unloaded. So if we turn our current up here, See, we've got seven and a half volts by 1.4 amps, and then we go up to two amps. And two amps is the cutoff, so you see the voltage start to drop there. So that's fine, we'll back it off a bit. 7.45, that's okay, um, but it shouldn't give the laptop any trouble with that voltage. We can bump it up just a bit. Uh, this is really only a um, adjustment, I, I mean, that's really only a current that you're gonna see if you um, are running an SCSI to SD module. So, I mean, if you're running a regular hard drive, that's the only time you're gonna see current even close to that. You can run this at under load for a while to test it if you want, but in general, my power supplies don't fail after recaps. They will fail beforehand or um, not at all. So the new caps and it works. So I'm going to go ahead and do this for my other two supplies here. And, um, then I'll show you how to seal them all up. Here's our second supply. It's hooked up under load about 1.75 amps. We've got 7.5 volts. Perfect. And it gets to nearly nine, eight volts when it's unloaded. So here's our final power supply. It's under load. You'll notice that the voltage is a bit low on this, but if I push down on the connector here, we end up with the seven and a half volts we're supposed to. So without touching this supply, we are still getting what we're supposed to. I have a feeling that maybe the barrel connector here is dirty or something and may need cleaned up. I'll have a look at that a little bit more later. But as far as the supply itself goes, the supply itself is running like it should. So I can go ahead and button this guy up and then take care of this uh, connector later. That's no big deal. All right, so we've recapped the power supply. We've tested it under load and made sure everything works. Now we have to seal it back up. The best way to do that is just to use some super glue. Uh, brand doesn't matter, are most super glues the same? They have some additives in them to make some of them a gel, yada, yada, yada. But in general, it's all the same chemical makeup. Uh, what I do is I put a bead along the inside edge here on the box and I do it on both sides, which gives me a 
pretty decent seal on the box, but not so bad that I can't get in here if the fuse ever blows or if the power supply ever has trouble. Um, it's fairly easy to crack open again. One of the benefits of the way we opened it is that there's, when, we're, when we close it all up, there's no evidence that it's been pried open except for under that little rubber grommet. And that rubber grommet continues to fill that void pretty well. Um, here it's dry, so I end up having to get the mating side wet on this because I gotta activate the super glue. It's not, there's just not enough humidity in our air here to accomplish that naturally. So when you go to close it, make sure that you get your grommet in place like so. The, oh, fight me here. The top tab slides into place and then you just push it closed. Uh, at this point, I usually like to put a clamp on here for, you know, whatever the instructions say. These instructions say 10 to 20 seconds or whatever. If you get any spillage, just, you know, wipe it up before it has time to cure so it doesn't look bad on the outside. But, um, yeah, after you've accomplished that, you're ready to use it in about 30 minutes. All right, now that we've completed our rebuild of a PowerBook 100 series brick, let's use our PowerBook 100 series computers. Um, this one happens to have been completely rebuilt. Uh, it's got all new caps in the logic board, SCSI to SD. The trackball has been cleaned up and works again. The LCD was even pulled apart and recapped because believe it or not, there are eight tiny electrolytics inside the LCD driver. The only thing left for me on this machine is the battery, which is still the original lead acid, but I'm working on a lithium replacement for it. I will have a video about that up soon. So if you have any comments or questions or concerns, leave them in the comments below. I'm more than happy to answer any questions you might have. And, you know, happy Marchintosh. Thank you for watching.